Welcome to Ottawa Business Matters. I'm Sam LaPrade. We're here to inform, inspire, and influence. And of course, the Ottawa Board of Trade, the president and CEO, Su Ling Ching, joins us here every week. And she's here again. Hello. Hi, Sam. I feel like I just spent so much time with you because, mm -hmm. of course, the big breakfast, mm -hmm. the mayor's breakfast, mm -hmm. was a very big deal last week. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm happy to spend lots of time with you. And uh, yes, we were so pleased to be able to co-host the mayor's breakfast, uh, of course, with the mayor's office and the uh, Ottawa Business Journal mm -hmm. and to host as our keynote speaker, uh, Premier Doug Ford. Now, there's not many reasons I get out of bed at 5 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> but I do for the mayor's <laughs> breakfast. Mm -hmm. This one, there was a lot of people that were up bright and early that morning. Mm -hmm. And and I was commenting a little bit earlier that we arrived and it was dark, mm -hmm. and then the sun was rising, mm -hmm. and there was good news, there really, was... really good news. Mm -hmm. Tell us what happened. So, uh, well, it was a popular event, so we mm -hmm. had to move it from the City Hall to the Shaw Centre. And uh, so over 600 business and community leaders came out uh, to see the premier and and you and I <laughs> and the mayor <laughs> yeah. and but we were really pleased because the premier did bring good news uh, of a new deal for Ottawa so the Queen's Park has and the government of Ontario has committed over 543 million dollars in both operating and capital costs to support Ottawa's uh, development as an economic hub in Ontario in eastern Ontario and so we're really looking forward to unpacking what all of that means, but we know it's an investment in um, transportation and highways, an investment in uh, economic development and the revitalization of downtown, as well as uh, safety and security. Mm -hmm. So. It was good news for business, and mm -hmm. I love that it was announced in front of the business community. Mm -hmm. And 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 I loved that you know, uh, out of the six hundred people that were there, there were so many business leaders. There was nonprofit leaders. Mm -hmm. It was this beautiful mix. Mm -hmm. But why was it so good for business that morning? Well, I think that um, first of all, I want to compliment and thank the mayor and the premier for using our event to make this announcement. Um, and I think what's important is that. Aside from, of course, the direct impact it will have on our tax base, on our ability to grow the economy, uh, to shape the city into a place where we can attract investment and talent and students and visitors. So aside from all of that, I think it was a very clear demonstration of Queen's Park's commitment and acknowledgement of the importance of the Ottawa economy. Uh, Ottawa is unique, and I know I've said this many times, but you know, all Canadian cities were impacted <clears throat> over the course of the pandemic, but none more so than Ottawa, because we have such a big public sector presence here, which has always been a strength of ours and continues to be a strength of ours. But in this new hybrid world, we need to be thoughtful about how we're going to transform our city uh, so that we are taking advantage of all the opportunities of before us, but also making time for the transformation and the challenges that we are facing. Mm -hmm. So we are a geographically um, diverse uh, community. Uh, we have this huge public sector. We have all kinds of amenities that we can capitalize on, all kinds of talent that comes into the nation's capital. And so uh, I think this new investment from uh, the Ontario government will uh, give us a little more breathing room in moving that forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I can't help but notice uh, the relationship between Mayor Mark Sutcliffe mm -hmm. and the Premier. Mm -hmm. uh, very friendly. They mm -hmm. told some funny stories mm -hmm. about working together. Mm -hmm. And you could really see that there's respect there, mm -hmm. that they do have each other um, you know, on speed dial, if you will, for things that are happening in the city. That was a really nice uh, part of the day that I think maybe people were surprised about. Mm -hmm. So over and above the news itself, I would say mm -hmm. we all had a lot of fun at yeah. that event as well. And we, you know, we were very impressed too with the relationship that they, they're both kind of, you know, they have both have a great sense of humor. Mm -hmm. They're both warm people, and uh, you know this deal didn't just come together overnight, right? This has been a lot of work on the part of the city and the mayor, and so we appreciate that leadership. And the mayor has said it in his comments, and we concur at the board of trade, as we did during the election, is that we were looking for leaders that were willing to be reasonable, to work together, to be collaborative, to be forward thinking. And I think that Thursday morning was a demonstration of that for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, there was a lot talked about that day. One thing that really stuck with me 
is how uh, Premier Doug Ford mentioned Cameron Love, mm -hmm. of course, the, you know, the head of the Ottawa Hospital mm -hmm. undertaking this new campus on, mm -hmm. on Carling Avenue. And he really talked about how important that hospital is and the commitment of the Ford government to that mm -hmm. hospital. But I loved that he knew that that would be important to business mm -hmm. leaders. Business leaders want to attract talent to this city for the, you know, we call it, talked about it all the time, mm -hmm. work, play, and, mm -hmm. and, and live. Mm -hmm. That this city is going to have that kind of healthcare infrastructure that we require. Yes, and so, uh, yeah, it was great to have Cam there that day, and, and I think we're going to bring him on the show to mm -hmm. talk more about what's going on at the hospital. And he's also agreed to be at our city building summit, which is coming up on April 23rd. And I think that's just one example of um, the innovation that we see in Ottawa and how the hospital will be a world-class health care and research facility. Um, and that it's understood because we have executives like Cameron uh, who are also working closely every day with decision makers at every level of government to make sure that we have the attention that we need and that we deserve here in Ottawa as an economic driver. Yeah, it was a really, really important day. Uh, was there anybody that you sort of think about when this announcement was made mm -hmm. that um, that was really going to be benefiting from this? I mean, we, we hear about, uh, you know, obviously the transportation piece, mm -hmm. and we heard about a little bit about Invest Ottawa. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody that you think really that that's a good day for them? Well, I, you know what I said, Sam, after is that it was a good day for Ottawa. Mm -hmm. So if there's one thing we know is that the business community is connected to the community at large, is connected to our young people. Every sector impacts, you know, each other. Every size of business impacts each other. So it was a great day for Ottawa. And, uh, you know, it was great having the Premier there, but we also had the Finance Minister there, the Minister of Transportation, the Minister of Colleges and Universities, and it really demonstrated how they also understand how those different portfolios were all impacted in that new deal mm -hmm. for Ottawa. So really, you know, it was a proud day for us to be able to showcase the Ottawa business community and the community at large. Um, we did afterward, you know, they did, uh, we did a tour uh, of Samina out in um, Canada North. I know that they, you know, did a photo op at Barnsdale as well. And so I think everyone needs to understand that all of us have our areas of focus for sure, but that we're all connected as well. Mm -hmm. MVP Lisa McLeod joined us here mm -hmm. last week. Very excited about Barnsdale and that new interchange, what the, it's going to mean for business in that community. Mm -hmm. I was driving down Barnsdale this week. I thought, you're about to change. Mm -hmm. uh, it, those pieces are really key. As much as we obviously want to be focused on the downtown, there's businesses all over this city. There's businesses all over the city and all over this region. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that Barnsdale interchange will be, you know, impactful for the whole uh, uh, national capital region. And um, so it's, a, it's an exciting time. And she's a real advocate for Ottawa. And so we're lucky to have her as a representative at Queen's Park. You mentioned the City Building Summit coming up April 23rd. Mm -hmm. How can people get some more information about that? So they can just go to our website, ottawabot.ca. Of course, our members get premium pricing, but everyone is welcome. Uh, so we expect to have a large and diverse representation from the community and the business community. Uh, we have some great speakers lined up and important topics to talk about. Um, and, uh, and then the other thing I would mention is that we're really excited about the idea of having some young leaders there as well. And so I encourage all of our members and, and the businesses that are signing up to come to invite a young person to come along with them uh, and make sure that they're at the table understanding what's going on in the city as our future leaders and then also an opportunity for us to integrate their perspective into our conversations. I love that. Mm -hmm. The objective of that day, what mm -hmm. at the end of the day when you walk away from that event, what's the objective you're hoping to meet? Mm -hmm. So I think the objective is to make sure that we calibrate what everybody thinks about what city building means so it's about the infrastructure in the city for sure it's about the people of the city it's about things like uh, nature and culture and the assets that we have and how we integrate those things together and the the day is really intended to bring in whatever the hot topics are um, as they pertain to shaping our city as we move forward so uh, the agenda this year will be around the downtown it'll be around housing it'll be around around 
uh, what some of those high impact projects are like the new hospital. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the airport and all the exciting things that are going on there. Um, places like you know developments like uh, Zibi as well um, so yeah so it's about you know making sure that everybody understands all the great opportunities and strengths that we have uh, to have uh, conversations uh, and network with people who are interested in being involved in, in the future of the city. Mm -hmm. We have a great show coming up today, obviously, mm -hmm. as always. Aaron Crow is going to join us in a little bit, of course, mm -hmm. CFO for the Ottawa Senators. Those conversations are really important as well as we think about downtown. Uh, I'm excited to hear from Aaron today. Yes, I am. Uh, I'm a big fan of Aaron Crow as, mm -hmm. as a really dynamic uh, female business leader in our community, mm -hmm. and uh, she's always had a really close relationship with the Board of Trade, and it's made, been maintained. Uh, with her role at the Ottawa Senators as well. So. Absolutely. I uh, noticed the other day, as a member of the Ottawa Board of Trade, I noticed the other day lots of, of events coming up. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it's really nice that there's some in the morning for us mm -hmm. early risers, mm -hmm. like the Mayor's <laughs> Breakfast, uh, which is coming, of course, uh, mm -hmm. next week as mm -hmm. well. And then uh, you've got events after work and mm -hmm. events on the weekend. You've really tried to make sure there's something for everyone. Yes. So we have, uh, as the a voice of business and all business in Ottawa, of course, we have uh, many different sectors we represent in size of business, entrepreneurs who are busy during the day, uh, people who have uh, time to come out early in the morning. So we do have a variety of opportunities for people to network, uh, for them to hear about what's going on in the community and for them to be involved in those conversations as well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Mayor's Breakfast coming up, uh, mm -hmm. the, the head of Porter. I think mm -hmm. that is fantastic to have that type of uh, person here as well yeah. because of course aviation is so important in, in terms of the city. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so transportation is very important to us. Our airport um, has undergone many challenges and so we're really impressed with the way that they have uh, bounced back after the pandemic and how we continue to grow our direct routes, which is so important not just to our visitor economy, but also to business development. And so uh, we're grateful to Porter for how they've invested in Ottawa and we're looking forward to hearing more from them. Wonderful. As always, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Su Ling Shing, of course, she's the president and CEO of the Ottawa Board of Trade. When we come back, we have a representative from Higher Immigrants Ottawa. Stay with us on Ottawa Business Matters. talk about such an important subject today and I'm so excited to welcome to the show Henry Akenko and he is with Hire Immigrants Ottawa. Hello. How are you? I'm doing very well Sam and yourself. I'm so excited to have you here. Thanks so much for being here. Well, a pleasure to be here. When I think about Ottawa and the growth of Ottawa we need lots of people to help us grow this city and, and you're at the heart of this. First of all tell us a little bit about about Hire Immigrants Ottawa. Uh, so Hi Immigrants Ottawa is a community-wide initiative of United Way East Ontario and the work we do is to engage employers around immigrants employment looking at the demand side um, the barriers and challenges employers have to effectively attract hire and integrate immigrants into the workforce and this fits in with United Way's um, a focus area of uh, from uh, poverty to possibility and this recognizes the importance of uh, financial independence as um, a strategy to address uh, poverty and so this is part of the work we do around community wealth building. It's incredible and when I think about somebody arriving to Canada maybe they're arriving this time of year and they've missed the snow um, but arriving to Canada and and really not knowing anybody not having any connections it would be quite daunting for a family to do that and then to think about you know if they've got children they're thinking about schooling and and where to live and and then of course the work piece and many people come to this country and they have incredible skills how are we making sure there's a good match there for for the work that we hope they do um th these are uh, very important uh, points you raise in terms of the the journey one goes through to uh, settle in a new country and uh, employment is a significant part of it uh, most of the other pieces in terms of the settlement. Uh, we have a lot of initiatives on the ground to support people uh, settle. But one of the pieces that has been missing for a very long time was who was 
asking a question from the employer side. Uh, what can we support employers to do more of to help shorten the integration time uh, for individuals so they can um, get into work and meaningfully contribute to our society. So this is where our work comes in. Uh, we are the only initiative of its kind um, in, in this region that focuses exclusively on supporting employers to make sure that they are doing their bit and they have what it takes to uh, support the integration of uh, individuals. The good news is Ottawa continues to be a destination of choice for many uh, immigrants. Um, we are seeing our numbers grow. We are currently uh, looking at about uh, 2,000 permanent residents who are arriving in our city uh, on a monthly basis. We uh, welcomed um, 21,300 new permanent residents uh, last year alone. And so that tells you that um, we are doing something right in terms of our profile around the world to attract people. But once people get here, it's important we make sure that they feel at home, they feel welcome, and they want to um, set roots here because uh, we don't want secondary migration happening when people are moving off to other places. But the work around um, integration is, is a process. Employers have a role to play in supporting the employees. They need to find the talent. They need to know where to look. And they need to also look at their HR policies and practices to make sure that the systems that had in place that worked very well for them 10 years ago are recalibrated such that they are working for them. We talk about inclusive economy. We want to make sure that everybody who has the ability to contribute is given an equal opportunity to be able to contribute. Um, but all too often, we see a lot of barriers come in the way of uh, immigrants trying to get into the labor force. And uh, these are some of the things we are trying to, to support employers to find ways to get around some of these barriers that they encounter and to make sure that they're able to put our newcomer talent into good productive use. Because, it, you know, I can only imagine from an employer's perspective, maybe you get, you know, 15, 20 resumes and you're looking, you see a resume with incredible uh, skills and experience, but maybe that experience took place in another part of the world and, and really opening the door to somebody that could have wonderful experiences and, and really contribute here in this country. Th that's, that's very true. Uh, unfortunately, we are not seeing many employers recognize the value of that international experience from another part of the world. So we talk about new perspectives, new ways of doing things, new ideas coming from other places. Um, the biggest challenge that immigrants often face is employers asking for Canadian work experience. Somebody's got to give you the first job to have that Canadian work experience. But what we emphasize is look at the transferable skills. The focus should be on the skills, the experiences that somebody has doing the job that you are re recruiting them for, and not where that experience was, was got. Um, even within Canadian organizations, every workplace has a different culture and has a different way of doing this. So when people move from one job to the other, there's always some period of time where you need to onboard them, you need to provide them some uh, training to get them up to speed. It's the same thing with somebody coming from another country. But more importantly, they are bringing new perspectives. So let's begin to think about what is the value add they are bringing from another country? How do they solve a particular problem in another jurisdiction that we can learn from? Rather than wanting the exact same old way we do things here then we lose the value of that international experience. Mm -hmm, beautifully said. And, and when you do work with employers, you sometimes uh, award them uh, with recognition with the fact that they've, uh, they've embraced uh, you know, other people uh, coming to, to this country and new Canadians. Um, how important is it for you to have that strong relationship with employers? Yeah, so we, we have an annual employer summit and um, this year was just last week. Um, that we, uh, we held this summit and as part of the summit is uh, often a recognition of um, some workplaces that are leading the pack in terms of demonstrating exemplary practices in the way they attract, hire and integrate immigrants uh, into the workplace. So we have the Employer Excellence Awards. And the value of this is uh, to do two things for us. One is um, to highlight the work that is being done so that for those who are not convinced that uh, there's a lot of um, value to 
uh, doing this work and doing it well, um, to learn from others uh, doing this, but also to encourage those who are already doing this work uh, to continue to do it because um, there's a lot of um, a value to having a diverse workforce. And so we, we know through um, the Ottawa Business Growth Survey that the Boss of Trade uh, 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 carries out every year with Abacus data. Employers highlight you know, access to scale workforce as one of the top three challenges that they have. But we also know through that same survey, uh, because the Board of Trade has been uh, our partner and they've um, um, understood the importance of immigration as a source of talent. And so they've added a few questions to engage their members' perceptions of immigration as a source of talent and for their own businesses. Mm -hmm. We do see the numbers are high. Local business see immigration as an important source of talent. But when we begin to probe further with those questions about whether they see this as uh, a source of talent for their own businesses, we begin to see the numbers go down. Yeah. Where people or uh, businesses have hired an immigrant before, we see the numbers go up because they see the value, they see the work ethic, they see the innovation, they bring the different uh, perspectives, they value having that uh, diverse workforce. And so we see the numbers go up. So it's important that that story is told uh, so that other businesses can learn from those who are already uh, doing this work. And also, those best practices, people don't need to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. If others have done it, it's documented, you can learn from that, run with it. So well, we are you. happy to disseminate some of this um, information and we usually uh, use our summit as um, a platform to be able to uh, recognize um, employee excellence. Brilliant, I love that. There's so much in that way you just said, I love that so much. And when you think about Ottawa, we obviously think about high tech, we think about the government piece, we think about healthcare, we think about retail, we think about you know strong private sector. Uh, there's room for everybody here, right, uh, Henry? There is, um, you know, we often describe the auto economy from a labor market point of view as a knowledge-based economy because of the types of jobs we have here. You know, as you described, the high tech, the government, you know, we have uh, big uh, world-class um, hospitals. But we also have small businesses. And as our city grows, there's also the build part of our city that, that is happening. You look around and you see infrastructure going up. And so we need skill sets um, across board in different areas. So we need people to do that fiscal build. So we need skills trade. We need a knowledge-based people to power all those uh, sectors of our economy that we have. But we also, through the work we do um, around community well building, recognize that we also have small businesses. And we need to support those small businesses. We know small and medium-sized enterprises are the engine of any economy. That's where most of the hiring happens. So if you take the Ottawa Boards of Trades by local campaign, that fits into our work in community wealth building about let's keep our money here. Let's make sure it circulates within the local economy a few times before it leaves mm -hmm. so that we can create that multiply effect. If small businesses prosper, they create jobs, they hire local people, our economy improves and it grows. So uh, we have a very diverse uh, economy uh, locally and there are different facets and these are all interconnected. You know, the workforce development pieces related to the build work that is going on, related to the other facets. Um, and for newcomers, um, when people have jobs, people can take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. There's no greater joy than being able to take care of yourself, than wanting handouts from any um, level of government. Yeah, beautifully said. We have 30 seconds. Tell us how someone can get in touch with you. Um, uh, we uh, 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 can be reached through our website, uh, highimmigrantsottawa.ca. Uh, uh, we are located at 363 uh, Coventry uh, Road at uh, United Way uh, East Ontario. Uh, through the Ottawa Boards of uh, Trades as well, they are a great partner. Um, they uh, collaborate with us on a number of initiatives. So if you're a member of the Board of Trades, you can connect us uh, uh, through uh, that. 
and also um, follow us on our social media handles uh, as well. We'll do it for sure. Thank you so much, Henry. Appreciate your time. Well, thanks very much for this opportunity. Sam. Absolutely. Henry Apeko joining us today from Higher Immigrants Ottawa. When we come back, Aaron Crow is going to be here from the Ottawa Senators. Stay with us on Ottawa Business Matters. Well, I'm so excited to introduce you to the one and only Erin Crow from the Ottawa Senator. She's the COO and the CFO. Hello. Hello. Those are big titles. I'm not going <laughs> to I'm not going to even sugarcoat it. That's a lot of work you've got going uh, with that great hockey team. Yes, it's a, it's actually a super fun role, I have to say. Um, there's always something going on, and uh, and some days I feel like a jack of all trades and a master of none, and other days I, I feel the opposite. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Do you get a chance to actually watch any games, Erin? I do. Yes. I do. I'm a fan, for yeah, sure. For yeah. sure. Now, listen, we were together uh, a couple of weeks ago to the most beautiful gala in this city. The, uh, the Ottawa Senators uh, Community Foundation put on a stunning gala on the ice. I kept forgetting we were on the ice because yes. it was so beautiful. But that night was not only great food and a great celebration, it was so much more than that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, Jacqueline Belsito and the Senators Community Foundation have done an amazing job really bringing this foundation back to life over the last couple of years. Um, the gala was really, I'd say, a culmination of all the work that's been done um, in that time. And I'm really thrilled with the fact that we raised over $650,000, that there were two donations made to uh, Roger Nielsen House and Maison Papillon and Gatineau. Um, a million dollars each, which is incredible for this city, right? And really meaningful. Really meaningful. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, um, Michael Ann Lauer, the, the principal owner, uh, spoke beautifully about, about coming to Ottawa. They've really, both him and his wife, I, I really I sense every time I hear them speak, just have really embraced the city. And we needed that, Erin. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, they're here in the city a lot. They've bought a house here. Um, they are really passionate about Ottawa and about this team and about this team's success in Ottawa, right? And they understand, I think, what the Senators mean to the city, um, and they are really embracing that, right? And really do, trying to do what's always right for our fans and for the city. And I think that's an amazing uh, way to think about new ownership and, and for them to come in and really get ingrained in this community. Yeah, what a, what, what a fantastic night. And, and, you know, I can't help but think too, when we think about business, we think about the potential of that of that arena heading downtown and what that will do for business downtown. You live and breathe and sleep this project. <laughs> I know this. Uh, tell me a little bit about about what it would mean to you to sort of make that change. Yeah, I mean it's a it is a it is a transformational project for the city, right? And so I think um, it's something that means a lot to me. I think, you know, one of the reasons I came back to the Senators in 2022 was because of what it means to the community. And this project means a lot to the community. And I think having an arena downtown um, is really a catalyst for some of the things that we need to do to drive that, uh, you know, the growth of our downtown, the revitalization. The mayor's talked about it. Sue Ling's talked about it. Um, everybody's talking about it, right? And this is huge. Um, but it's a it's a big project and it's going to take time and it's going to take patience and it's going to take a belief that this really is something that matters to our city and and our stakeholders um, you know we need, we need the support and that that passion for this project as well there's some people you're one of them that makes leadership look easy so you just you know just the way you conduct yourself the the calmness and, and i see it with serial leader to be honest as well just a very humble i'm going about my work but these are transformational projects that you're working on you were awarded cfo of the year in 2022 which was an exciting time but how i know it's i know leadership isn't easy so how do you make <laughs> it look easier and tell us your secrets oh that's a very good question um i i'm glad i make it look easy i don't always feel like it's easy frankly um but I think, you know, I, my approach to work and to life and to all the things I do is really just to do things that I enjoy doing, um, try and do the right things all the time, whether it's with in the community, whether it's with the team at the Senators, uh, whether it's at home, right? All of those things, do the right thing, 
um, lead by example and just believe that you're going to accomplish what you need to accomplish with that pat with that in mind mm -hmm. and and being a woman in this I'm, I'm hoping there's some day where we don't even have to say that <laughs> but being a woman in a c-suite that typically is men in sports there's some barriers there have you had do you feel like you broke through or do you think you you you, you worked your way through them how, how and, and is it still a, a challenge or is it a challenge at all yeah I mean so it's interesting question some days I absolutely feel like I've broken through and other days I think wow nope haven't haven't broken through right so um, I think early in my career I just I didn't pay any attention to that I kind of worked 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 and uh, I think was able to you know just not just focus on my on getting my job done and using that as sort of my ability to to grow um, I think in more recent years I've said okay wait a second I can be a role model for women um, who are coming up and trying to be successful and working at being successful and so I've kind of I look at things now with that lens um, and I think when I look at things with that lens, I still see that there are barriers, right? And I see that there are um, perhaps times where the perception is that you don't have that senior role or you, you know. But then there's also times where I think you can demonstrate that you have the knowledge, the capacity, the leadership skills to be in that senior role and people accept you there. So it's, it's all over the map, but I, I'd say we just have to keep pushing forward and keep believing that um, as we continue to support women in leadership roles, that that growth will continue to come. Mm -hmm. I really noticed at the, the mayor's breakfast how many women leaders were there. And of course, Doug Ford, uh, Premier, coming in, announcing some, some very big things. But I do notice um, a, lot of, a lot of senior leadership. You have served um, on the Ottawa Board of Trade. You're still involved with them. How important is it that, that women are at those tables? Oh, I think it's really important that women are at those tables, right? You've got to see those women in leadership positions. You've got to see those women influencing decisions that are made. Um, we always talk about diversity at, around the table, right, and how much benefit that brings. So I think that's also important. Um, I sit on a couple of other boards as well, the Briere uh, Health Board, and I sit on the Centers Community Foundation Board, and again, you know, diversity is something that we always have to be aware of um, because there are so many benefits it brings. Mm -hmm. um, so to walk me through the day in the life of Aaron Crow. So, you know, because I can only imagine, I mean, there's big decisions. I was thinking about you when the team ownership thing was happening. I thought, is Aaron getting any sleep? Um, <laughs> no. Because, exactly. They will answer that. No, there wasn't any sleep. But even now, like managing this project, because there's a lot of demands. A lot of people are looking to say, when is this happening and how is the decision being made? Uh, how do you manage your every day? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um I, I guess I kind of compartmentalize my every day into the things that I need to get done that day and then sort of the big rocks or the big projects that we've got to continue moving forward that but go at a, a much slower pace and you kind of have to inch them forward as opposed to, you know, we are not going to make a decision on Arena tomorrow, but we've got to do a hundred things in the background to keep that project moving forward. So it's just making sure you, you know, for me, as I approach my day, thinking about the balance between What's today and what's tomorrow, and how do I make sure I'm I'm moving both of those things at the same time? Yeah, geez, it's it's like magician's work. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, and the Ottawa Board of Trade, and I know you've obviously been close to them, but but I would think because I, I find every time somebody asks about the arena, then you also see, see Su Ling give yeah. a comment <laughs> because you know she is representing the voice of business. So I, I see often you know that that sort of uh, dichotomy there where where business is going to be affected. How key is it for you to be close to the Ottawa board of trade and and hear from the members as well oh I think it's really important right I mean when we talk about an arena it has an impact on everybody in the city right what wherever you're from in the city um, whether it's Ottawa whether it's Gatineau whether it's East West it doesn't matter right that would be a transformational project and so staying close with the board of trade and their initiatives that they have around city building downtown revitalization I think um, they all tie in so tightly um, Suling and I see each other regularly I would say at different events and also I sit on the Economic Development Committee at the Board of Trade so um, certainly uh, always being aware of what's happening and making sure that we're aligned as we think about the bigger projects in the city is important. Mm -hmm. And it, I just find the city is just, it, you know, speaking about transformational in terms of the arena, I find we're just transformational, whether it be transportation, the new hospital, like yeah. it's, it's, it's a little bit scary for people. And sometimes people get negative and I just, I, I'm not, I'm not up for negativity. So I'm, I'm very much like, this is a positive time. This is an exciting time. And then adding the arena into that mix, it just, it adds even more excitement. 
Yeah, I mean, there's so much going on in the city that is positive, right to your point. The LRT is a transformational project. The hospital is a transformational project. Um, these are, you know, these are life changing, and they you know, when we talk about live, work, play, they those impact that quality of life in Ottawa, and the arena will do the same thing. Um, so these are, you know, Ottawa has a lot going for it, and we don't maybe sell it enough to mm -hmm. our community and our our citizens, right? And um, do you still get like even even for myself, I go to maybe you know six ten games a year, but I still get kind of butterflies that we've got an NHL team here. Even after all these years, it, it never gets old to me to walk into the to the rink and and you know see us playing, whether it be the Leafs or whether it be <laughs> you know Columbus or whoever's playing. It, it's still an exciting thing to think a city of a million people have this. Do you still get the butterflies? I do. You yeah. know, it's funny and and you think about. Uh, about this team and this city and you see the people that care so much about the team and the kids <clears throat> that care so much about the team and they're growing up as Senators fans and you walk around the city and you see people with their Senators gear on and you just think wow people care right and this means a lot to the city and uh, we mean a lot to the city so um, and we've got an owner who is passionate about that too as we talked about so I think that's all just you know it really it does make you emotional when you start to think about it. Mm -hmm. And working with Michael Landlauer, I mean, you, 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 obviously you can tell that there's <clears throat> there's passion there. He's excited. He talked about that this was at the galley. He talked about this. This, this is a story that's being told here. And I got emotional when he said yeah. that because you can see that he gets how all the pieces work together. I, I thought it was really special, too, that on the opening day he had Rod Bryden and Bruce Firestone and the Melnick girls there. I think that was a nod to what's happened, but also very much future thinking. Absolutely right. I mean... We have a history. We don't want to forget our history. We've had great people and owners here. Um, we now have Michael Ann Lauer here, and I really think the future is bright, right? We've got a team in place who who believes, you know, if you think of Michael, Steve Steo, Dave Poulin, they believe in the future of this team, and I believe in the vision they have for the future of this team. And you can't sort of turn a ship like 90 degrees overnight, but you really can continue to work on it. Um, and the vision is there and the passion is there and the desire is there. Beautifully said. I'm going to end our interview like I did with uh, Cyril Leader. Go Sens go. Go <laughs> Sens go. Thank you so much. Thank I you. appreciate it. Thank you so much. Erin Crow, of course, joining us today. She's the COO and the CFO of the Ottawa Senators. When we come back, Roxanne Whiting is going to be here. And I know you're going to be here. Stay with us on Ottawa Business Matters. I am so glad you are back on Ottawa Business Matters. I'm Sam LaPrade. I wanted to introduce you to a lady I'm getting to know today too, and that is Roxanne Whiting. Hi, how are you? I'm well, thanks. It's great to be here with you and talk about a sign. You are the co-founder and also uh, with business development. So tell me a little bit about your role uh, at this wonderful organization. Sure, so I'm not one of the founders. I'm one of the co-owners. Co There's Perfect. two other women um, that uh, I share the pleasure of owning a sign. And um, we've been around since 1997, uh, so celebrating 27 years in June. That's fantastic. So tell us what you do. So my role is Director of Business Development. Uh, I'm also a practicing uh, American Sign Language interpreter, and I've been doing that for the last 26 years. Um, my role now is communicating, reaching out, networking, letting people know about our services, mm -hmm. and um, also you know, trying to bring more business um, into the company uh, yeah. as well. But Which yeah. is great. Yeah. So, so tell me how you got involved. What, what, where, where did it all start for you? Well, both of my parents are deaf. So oh. my first language is American Sign Language. And then I learned English pretty much simultaneously because my grandmother used to watch me when I was a baby. So I was bilingual from birth, ASL, and English. And then... Um, you know, in high school you start thinking about career options and I had no idea what I wanted to do. My mother always said, you should be an interpreter. She worked for the federal government. She had interpreters that worked with her often. And I always, you know, no mom, I don't, you know, I don't want that. Um, so I kind of took a gap year and was working uh, some retail jobs and one of my um, 
teachers from middle school actually had come into one of the stores I was working and she said, Roxanne, why are you working here? And I said, income? <laughs> and she said, but you know sign language and we, you know, the federal government pays well and it's a viable career option. So it got me thinking about that and so fairly quickly after I did my research and off I went and uh, studied to become an interpreter. I love those turning points in people's lives. And it's amazing how a minute can change your whole life. Absolutely. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Would you do anything else? No, looking back, it, it's the right fit for me. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, being a child of deaf adults, um, I didn't really understand that distinction until later, like as an adult, and then interacting more with the deaf community outside of my parents' bubble, so to speak. So interacting with other deaf people and professionals and just really understanding that it's a culture and a community and that I had a place in it as part of that culture. And then understanding that I have a privilege being able to hear and kind of merging those two worlds together. So able to advocate for my peers and those that I know in the deaf community, but also being able to hear and enjoy things and understand things a little bit differently mm -hmm. than, than the deaf community. So who are the clients of Assign? Who's, who's working with Assign? So when we first uh, were established, um, our primary work was based here in Ottawa with the federal government, um, the Ministry Attorney General, so the Ottawa Courthouse. Then it started growing to unions contacting us for large conferences. And so that's kind of what we specialized in. There are other organizations that provide and get funding from the Ministry of Health to do medical appointments, and that's not our main source of income or specialization. We really focus on um, business type of interpreting, conference level. Uh, we're across Canada now. Lots of things changed um, with disability legislation, mm -hmm. but also with technology. So in 2014, the CRTC approved video relay service, which is a telecommunication service for the deaf, which re didn't replace, but was an upgrade from the old Bell relay service using a TTY mm -hmm. going through an operator third party. Mm -hmm. So now the third party still happens, but it's visual over video with the sign language interpreter. So deaf Canadians are able to make telephone calls to make an appointment, order a pizza, call work and so we were awarded a contract um, through the Canadian Administrator of Video Relay Services in 2016 and that changed our business overnight because as I said from 1997 up until 2016 our focus was only Ottawa. We did, we would be asked to go to other cities across Canada if there was a need but once we started doing that we needed more interpreters mm -hmm. so within a period of th three years I set up, along with my team, three call centers, one each year um, in Edmonton, Halifax, and then Toronto, and then COVID came around. Mm. And prior to COVID, we were already venturing into video remote interpreting, which is everything other than a telephone call over video. So the CRTC has said that, you know, placing calls, you can't be in the same room and use the interpreter because the funding is meant for telephone communication access. So having, so a deaf person couldn't show up at the car dealer, for example, and call video relay service to negotiate a deal on a car they want to purchase because of the funding parameters set out by the government. So video remote interpreting is something that, it's fee for service, but you can use the interpreter um, in different places. So that's one of the services we're offering on demand. We're at all Service Canada, 344 locations, so deaf people don't have to make an appointment and wait two weeks for an interpreter to be available to apply for employment insurance, renew their passport. They simply walk in, connect with our interpreter, and um, go about their business. So we've been doing that now for the last couple of years, and we have other clients too, but so technology, anyway, there's lots. <laughs> I've learned so much, I had no mm. idea. I think the average resident would have no clue. Probably not. Yeah. No, no unless you actually have first-hand experience or yeah. exposure um, to not being able to communicate with somebody, mm -hmm. then you don't know. 
right? Yeah. So part of my goal, my team's goal, is to educate and let the community know that there are services available, tools, mm -hmm. um, interpreters, translation, which again, when we think about translation, we think about text-based content, word for word, English to French or other languages. In the deaf community and to provide access, their first languages are ASL, which is American Sign Language, or LSQ, the Langue des Signes Québécois. So there's not one sign language across the world. For every spoken language, there's a signed language. So our translation takes text-based content and we interpret it, translate it into a video format that can be used on websites, social media posts, um, training doc, you know, training materials and so on. So, and that's also in addition to bringing an interpreter live on site, which we do as well. Wow, and, and is it hard to find the talent to be interpreters? I would, you know, that would be quite a, quite a skill set. Absolutely, yeah, there, not anybody can become an interpreter and because of the Accessible Canada's Act and various provincial disability legislation, the federal government um, has put out uh, some funding through Employment uh, Services Development Canada, ESDC, an opportunities fund and it's specifically focused on increasing the access to professional sign language interpreters, retaining and keeping the, and attracting new people into the field as well as um, finding opportunities to have more deaf people trained to teach sign languages um, amongst uh, several things. So mm -hmm. it's definitely an effort being made to increase the number of professional sign language interpreters because mm -hmm. there's always a demand for our services. We used to joke many years ago, I'd say 20 years ago, summer, yeah, we could probably get a break and Christmas time. Yeah. It's, we don't have those breaks anymore. Mm -hmm. It's very rare. And I think often, and, and I'm even doing it when you were mentioning COVID, we think about interpretation when it comes to emergencies. You know, we always saw the premier with an interpreter. We saw Correct. the prime minister with an interpreter, uh, the mayor, you know, th that type of thing. But but this is 365. I mean, this is not just in emergencies. Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it's going to take time. But interpreters should be part of everyday communication so there should be an interpreter on this show you know mm -hmm. other shows uh, mm -hmm. closed captioning is available but what people don't realize is that English or French and other written languages is not the first language of deaf people mm -hmm. so their understanding is not going to be complete or comprehensive mm -hmm. so that's where having an interpreter or having the content translated is very important and it's mm -hmm. critical for people to understand and consume the information because if they're reading it there's going to be misunderstandings. So if an entrepreneur is listening right now, a political representative, uh, anybody in our community, what advice would you have to you know for them if they're maybe having an event or they're wanting to engage uh, the deaf community how would you what advice would you give them today well as a first step um, of course you can reach us at a sign and depending on your event or some of the objectives that you're trying to achieve we can give you several different options um, but communication and outreach to the deaf community community through social media is critical deaf people are on social media mm -hmm. um, there used to be deaf clubs across the country, but with with time, technology, things have changed, and COVID, lots of those deaf centers are not there anymore. So it's become more online communication. So in order to reach the deaf community, let them know that you're accessible is critical, because if you don't let them know, they won't come. Mm -hmm. So it's not a matter of just um, putting out your event and saying once so we have interpreters like you really need to make an effort to communicate that externally. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, I can see why the Ottawa Board of Trade would be important to you because you're yes. working with with all the stakeholders we just talked about. Talk about the, the relationship with the Ottawa Board of Trade. Yeah, so it's new for us. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we've been in Ottawa, like I said, for 27 years, but uh, over time we've evolved, we've grown and it was time like we last year we made the decision to, to join the Ottawa Board of Trade and really get out there and, and make sure that people were aware of who we are, what services that um, we offer, and just really making sure that access is possible. So opening more doors to possibilities for not only people in Ottawa, but across Canada to have 
access to interpretation and communication because mm -hmm. that's really what it is. And you're really this lifeline, this life link for people. It's really just kind of hitting me now as we talk uh, yeah. how important it is. Well, if you think about it, deaf people, they're able-bodied people. Mm -hmm. They communicate in their own ways without interpreters, of mm -hmm. course. Like, they don't need us for every single moment of their life, but there are critical parts mm -hmm. in someone's life where you need an interpreter to communicate. So, mm -hmm. well, you know, we kind of say A to Z or, uh, you know, from cradle to grave, I don't even like to say that, but yeah, you know, there's there's so many things that, um, so we're everywhere. We interpret everything and anything um, from being in the courtroom to a kayaking course, or maybe I'm, <laughs> you know, so you could be really anywhere. Yeah. Really interesting line of work, too. Absolutely. I've learned so much today. I love yeah. this. Oh, good. Uh, where can we find you? So, assign.ca is our website. You'll find our contact information there. Um, you'll see some examples of what I mean by translating text based content into sign language because we have an avatar. It's, well, it's, we call it the floating translator, mm -hmm. but it is a live interpreter that we've recorded that's translating the content on our website. So as you scroll on the website, you're, the deaf community can get that live translation. And we have a English-French toggle button on their website, so you can wow. see it in LSQ too. But Amazing. certainly, yeah, assign.ca, there's a contact us form. And Perfect. We'd well, happy thank to you chat. so much. Thank you. Roxanne Whit Whiting thank you. joining us today, and she is the co-owner of Assign Also Business Development. It's been great spending time with you today on Ottawa Business Matters. I'm Sam LaPrade. Until next time.